Okay, uh, thank you so much, Victor. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers again uh, for this uh, wonderful conference online. Uh, today's talk is still about ranking under the BTL model. And this is also a joint work with my student Ping Han Chen and my co-author Anderson Zhang. And in my first talk, uh, I discussed the problem of top K ranking under the BTL model. And the goal of top K ranking is to estimate the set of the best K players uh, from pairwise comparison data. And we have shown that between the two most popular ranking algorithms used in the literature, uh, the MLE leads to optimal top K ranking, but the other popular spectral algorithm is uh, generally uh, not optimal. And today we are going to talk about another very interesting ranking problem called full ranking. So the goal here is not just to identify the best K players, but also to rank the entire set of players. This is called full ranking. Okay, so uh, let's first recall the setting of the BTL model that the probability of player I winning a game against uh, player J is proportional to a sigmoid function uh, of the difference of the scale parameters of the two players. And in our sampling scheme, uh, we still consider the same other training model uh, with connection probability P and assume P is at least of order log N over N. Uh, this is to make sure that the random graph uh, it has a single connected component. So as long as AIJ equals one, we then observe uh, the comparison results between uh, I and J as Y sub uh, IJL. So here we have capital L independent games uh, played between player I and J, and the result is modeled by a Bernoulli distribution uh, with uh, uh, a mean parameter uh, determined by the difference of the two scales, okay? So here, uh, what I would like to do is to uh, decouple uh, the uh, skill parameter from the rank of the player. So I, I'm writing uh, the skill parameter of the ice player by theta sub ri and the skill of the jade player by theta sub ij. Uh, in this way, uh, the parameters has two components. The first component is a decreasing vector, uh, which is the skill parameter of the uh, uh, players. Uh, we have theta one uh, through theta n. So in this way, theta one is the best, uh, is the scale of the best player, theta two is the second best, so on and so forth. And we also have the second component, this is the rank vector R1 through Rn, that we are trying to estimate. So in this problem, uh, we have R, the rank, as the parameter of interest, and the theta, which is a decreasing vector, uh, is uh, treated as the nuisance parameter of the model. So the last function that we are going to consider for full ranking is called Canel's tau. It measures the difference between two uh, rank vectors. The, de the definition is given by one over n times the number of inversions between each pair uh, of two rank vectors. So it may look uh, complicated, but uh, uh, we will introduce a second last function. It's called Spearman's foot row. Uh, the definition is straightforward, just uh, uh, one over n times the L1 norm between the difference uh, of the two rank vectors. So it turns out uh, you can easily show that uh, there is an equivalence between the two loss functions. So the two loss functions uh, uh, can be related to the inequality uh, with a factor of uh, at most two. So in this talk, I will just focus on uh, the loss of Canel's tau and the result can be obtained for uh, Spearman's vote rule uh, using this equivalence relation. So I would like to mention uh, the previous work by uh, Chen Mao, uh, Jonathan Weed, and Philip in 2018. Uh, I think uh, 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 they may be the first paper uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the literature that studies minimax ranking uh, under the last function of Kandel's tau. Uh, and in their paper, uh, they consider a setting called noisy sorting. Uh, this is actually uh, quite different from the BTL model that is uh, uh, discussed in today's talk. So, uh, uh, before stating the results, I will also like to talk about the regularity assumption for the skill parameter. Uh, uh, remember that uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the, top, the problem of top K ranking on Tuesday, our goal was to uh, estimate the set of the top K players. Uh, so we have assumed a condition uh, that uh, there is a difference between uh, the skill of the case player and the skill of the K plus one player, right? So there is some uh, parameter called delta that lower bounds uh, theta K minus theta K plus one. This is to make sure that the top K uh, set is uh, identifiable. And the current goal of today's talk is to estimate 
the rank of each player. Therefore, we have to assume such an identifiability assumption uh, between each pair of theta i and theta i plus one, okay? So we assume that theta belongs to the following parameter space. This is called the regularity condition of theta. So uh, for all decreasing vector, we consider theta such that the following condition is satisfied. So there is some number beta. This uh, stands for the signal uh, uh, strength of the model so that uh, beta is the lower bound for uh, each pair theta i minus theta i plus one. And moreover, there is a constant C0 such that C0 beta is an upper bound of the difference, okay? So in other words, uh, for each pair theta i and theta i plus one, uh, the difference is bounded between beta and C0 times beta uniformly over all i, okay? So I understand that uh, this assumption uh, may not be so realistic uh, when it comes to analyzing the real data. It can be certainly uh, weakened and extended uh, beyond this parameter space, uh, but in today's talk, I'm going to uh, focus on this prime space without talking about the extension. I think this already captures the main essence of the ranking problem, and we are going to work with that. All right, so uh, before talking about the uh, minimax rate under the uh, BTL model, I will first present the result under a much simpler uh, Gaussian uh, pairwise comparison model. And turns out ranking under the Gaussian model is a much simpler a problem than ranking under the BTL model. And we can already see uh, some of the unique and interesting phenomena uh, well illustrated by the Gaussian model. So the plan is to first to understand the Gaussian model and then we can talk about the more complicated results under the uh, BTL model. And I will then highlight the difference between a ranking in the Gaussian model and ranking under the BTL model. So for the Gaussian model, uh, we still have the same uh, sampling scheme. We have an early training graph for the sampling and P is greater than log N over N to make sure that the graph is connected. And uh, given that two players are connected by an edge, AIJ equals one, uh, the outcome of the comparison uh, between I and J is modeled by a Gaussian distribution. And the mean of the Gaussian is given by the difference of the scale parameter. Uh, and the variance is given by sigma squared. So the nuisance parameter of the model is uh, theta. And our goal is to estimate uh, the rank from the uh, Gaussian comparison results. So this is the Gaussian problem. Okay, uh, so the first result is for the minimax rate. So assume that uh, theta belongs to uh, uh, the space of regularity. Remember, this means that the difference between theta i and theta i plus one is of order beta, okay? And we also assume that P is at least of order log N over N to make sure we have a connected graph. And then uh, the minimax rate of full ranking uh, with respect to uh, the Kandel's task loss and the Gaussian model uh, can be uh, derived uh, as this formula. So this may look slightly complicated, uh, but as you can see, de uh, depending on uh, the parameter of signal to noise ratio, which in this case is defined as mp beta squared over sigma squared. So if this number is above one, then we get an exponential rate. Otherwise, if the signal to noise ratio is below one, uh, then the uh, convergence rate is actually polynomial. And the polynomial rate is kept by a number n because n is the largest possible value uh, the loss uh, Kandel style can take according to its definition. And in exponential rate regime, it is an average of uh, n minus one uh, exponential function. And in each exponential function, uh, the error exponent is uh, determined by the difference between theta i and theta i plus one, which reflects the local difficulty of distinguishing uh, between the i player and the i plus one player. Okay, so you can see uh, there is a very interesting uh, phase transition phenomenon uh, of the ranking problem between uh, an exponential rate of convergence and the uh, polynomial rate of convergence. And I want to emphasize that the minimax result is actually derived for each instance of theta. It is uh, very clear that the uh, exponential function is a function of theta, right? So when I define the minimax rate, uh, we only take supremum over the rank vector. We do not take supremum over, over theta. So the result actually uh, holds for each theta as long as theta uh, belongs to the regular uh, private space. 
Uh, so next, uh, what I'm going to do is just to simplify uh, the expression a little bit and talk about the phase transition phenomena. So let's consider the following special case, uh, just to assume that the difference between theta i and theta i plus one uh, is exactly beta. And then uh, the minimax rate can be simplified as uh, this expression. So we have the signal to noise ratio, MP beta squared over sigma squared, right? So the rate is either an exponential function of the S, uh, signal to noise ratio or uh, uh, a polynomial function. Uh, it is very clear there is a phase transition between uh, the two regime. And the reason behind the phase transition between the exponential rate and the polynomial rate is because of the uh, interesting property of the rank vector, right? So the rank vector itself can be just regarded as a usual n-dimensional continuous parameter. Uh, it's nothing special, but if you think about that, the rank vector is actually a discrete object. Each of its entry can only take an integer. So uh, when the signal to noise ratio is really large, uh, uh, this is when you can actually localize uh, the knowledge of uh, uh, the rank of each player to uh, uh, the neighborhood of the truth, right? So for example, you're really trying to tell the difference between uh, whether player I is ranked at the fourth position or at maybe at the fifth position, right? So. Uh, uh, the problem uh, is essentially a hypothesis testing problem. And it is not surprising that the uh, uh, error of a, a hypothesis testing problem is exponential in terms of the signal to noise ratio. But the, when the signal to noise ratio is uh, low, uh, this is when you do not see the discrete property of the uh, rank vector because everything is blurred by the noise, right? The noise level just to cover the property of the discrete uh, nature of the rank vector. So as in, in this case, when the noise is uh, high, uh, estimating a rank vector is just as if estimating a, a, a usual n-dimensional continuous parameter. And we know that uh, by a simple entropy argument, uh, you will have a polynomial rate. And uh, as the picture shows, uh, in addition to the polynomial phase and the exponential phase, uh, you also have uh, two uh, other phases. Uh, this is the random gas phase and the exact recovery phase. So when the signal to noise ratio is so low, it is below the order of one over n square. Uh, the rate of convergence is always n. Uh, this is the largest order that the loss function can take by the definition of Kandel's tau, and it can just be achieved by uh, random gas. So at the other extreme, when the signal to noise ratio is above four log n, uh, 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 when this is true, uh, according to uh, the minimax rate formula, uh, the error is going to be smaller than one over n, okay? Uh, and since the loss function is defined to be one over n times the sum of some indicators, once the loss function is below one over n, the only possible value it can take is zero. Therefore, we can, uh, in this regime, recover the rank vector with any error with high probability. All right, so uh, the optimal procedure to achieve the minimax rate under the Gaussian model is uh, very simple and straightforward. Just compute the maximum likelihood estimator and then rank the MLE. And this is the rate optimal procedure. And uh, since the model is Gaussian, so the computation of MLE is just a least squared estimator. Very simple to compute, very simple to analyze. And since we have the Gaussian linear model, you can exactly characterize the distribution of the estimator. Given uh, the realization of the random graph A, uh, theta hat is a Gaussian vector. Uh, the mean is given by theta, and the covariance is just uh, sigma squared times a matrix, which is given by the inverse graph Laplacian uh, of the erdos schrini graph. And using that knowledge, uh, we can exactly analyze the risk function, okay? So by the definition of the Kandel's tau, to analyzing the risk, uh, it, is, uh, 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 it suffices to analyze uh, each probability of Ri hat greater than Rj hat for all those pairs of ranks that are reversed, right? So and since by the definition, R hat is the rank of theta hat. So this probability equals the probability of theta i hat smaller than theta j hat. And then we can just uh, uh, analyze uh, this probability uh, using the Gaussian 
uh, distribution of the entire vector. And this can be easily done. And then uh, by summing up all the uh, Gaussian tail probability, uh, we just uh, obtain the minimax rate with the phase transition phenomenon. Okay, so uh, we have just uh, understood uh, 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 the property of ranking uh, under the uh, Gaussian model. I want to emphasize that the uh, uh, phase transition phenomena seems to be a unique feature of the ranking problem, uh, at least uh, uh, according to my best knowledge. Uh, I do not see this phenomena exhibits uh, in any other statistical estimation problem, but if you are aware of any other problem also has this phenomenon, uh, please let me know. So now I think we are ready to talk about uh, ranking under the BTO model, and I will especially highlight the difference uh, between uh, Bernoulli observation and a Gaussian observation. Uh, first of all, let's uh, try to build some intuition of the problem. So let's consider a very simple uh, a toy example of uh, this uh, model. So let's uh, 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 try to study the following Oracle problem. We are trying to estimate the first entry of uh, the rank vector theta, and we are going to assume all the remaining entries of theta uh, uh, are known. So estimate theta one, assuming the knowledge of theta two uh, up to theta n, right? So this is very simple problem. It's just a uh, easy one-dimensional uh, parametric estimation problem. And you can just use uh, MLE to estimate theta one uh, efficiently. And you can uh, find that uh, MLE of theta one is asymptotically normal. The asymptotic variance is given by the inverse uh, fish information. And in fact, we can uh, 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 explicitly uh, compute the fish information. It's very simple calculation. Uh, we call this uh, the Oracle fish information for estimating uh, the parameter theta one because we assume the knowledge of all the other parameters, right? So the fish information has this formula. So here, uh, I deliberately write the fish information formula as the sum of n minus one uh, different terms. So each term is given by L times P times the derivative of sigmoid evaluated at the difference between theta one and theta j, okay? And in fact, uh, each term in the sum can be understood as the information from games against a player J, right? So in this way, you can exactly quantify the contribution of games uh, played against each player, right? So you have uh, what you want to estimate is theta one, the opponents are theta two to uh, theta N. Uh, this is exactly how much information you get from games played against each player, right? And a simple property of the sigmoid function is that its derivative is an exponentially small function. So you can actually uh, uh, bound the information contributed by each player according to the rank. So because we assume theta is regular, the difference between theta one and theta j is of all the beta times the difference of the rank. In this case, this is the difference of j and one. So if uh, the rank of theta j is far away from the rank of theta one, then the contribution of the information will be exponentially small, okay? So this means uh, the players that eventually matter are only the players uh, uh, with close ranks, right? So you only need to care about the players uh, whose ability or skills are close to you. Uh, if, uh, if an opponent or a, a player is too weak or too strong, the contribution of the fish information will be exponentially small. You can just ignore these games play against these players because uh, there is no much, uh, there's not much information uh, in these games. And indeed, we can actually uh, truncate the summation. What if we only uh, take the sum over a neighborhood of uh, the first player, right? So let's consider uh, this neighborhood of size uh, m over beta. Here, we take m to be a very large constant then you can easily see we have this facial information approximation formula. The approximation is uh, error is given by uh, e to the power of negative n, which can be made very small, uh, uh, very fast, right? You just uh, choose m to be large. Okay, so this is, a, uh, I think this is the most important slide in this talk. Uh, uh, and all the phenomenon of the BTO model comes from as a consequence of this slide. And as you can see, uh, the number m of a, over beta can really be understood as the number of players that really matter, right? All the other players, it's not important. You can throw away the games. 
and uh, 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 M over beta can also be understood as the effective sample size of the model. So the effective sample size of the BTO model is of order one over beta. It's not of order n, right? So this is a very uh, uh, this is a very significant difference between ranking under the BTO model and the ranking under Gaussian, because for the Gaussian model, the effective sample size is the actual sample size n. Uh, for the for the, for the BTO model, it's not n; it's uh, uh, the order of one over beta. Okay. So I, I want to illustrate this phenomenon using uh, this very simple example. Uh, I, I believe this is basically the same example that I have used uh, on Tuesday's talk. Uh, and the the goal here is to compare Manchester United and Arsenal. We just want to decide uh, which team is uh, the stronger team between the two. Uh, as you can see, there is no edge between Man United and Arsenal, so you cannot make direct comparison. Uh, the comparison has to be made through the games played against other teams, right? For example, let's look at the games played against Oxford United. If you know Oxford United, uh, this is a team in League One. Uh, this is the third. Uh, uh, this is the third uh, uh, league uh, in in the English football. So Oxford United is a much weaker team than both Man United and Arsenal. Let's say you have 20 games played against, uh, uh, sorry, played between Man United and Oxford United. It's very likely Man United will win all the game, right? And the same thing will happen for Arsenal. Arsenal will also, you know, likely to win all the games against Oxford United. So it's not helpful to look at the games against Oxford United if the goal is trying to compare Man United and Arsenal. However, uh, Everton is a different story, right? So Everton is a much stronger team. It's a Premier League team. Uh, and if you consider uh, the games between Man United and Everton, uh, maybe Man United will win about 70% uh, uh, of the game. Uh, Arsenal, you know, it, it, I think it's it's a 50-50 chance maybe, right? So uh, 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 if you compare against Everton, it's very clear that Man United will be a stronger team than Arsenal. Uh, this, and this example shows you that uh, uh, if you want to uh, do a ranking, uh, players with uh, close uh, abilities or skills are much important than players with uh, 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 players are too weak or too strong. Okay, and I also uh, uh, want to remark that uh, we have uh, sorry, and I also want to remark that we have this uh, very interesting double rows for the parameter beta, right? Uh, as I just. Uh, 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 you know, according to the definition of the parameter space, beta is the signal strength, right? It defines uh, the uh, difference between neighboring, the skills of neighboring players, theta i and theta i plus one. If beta is zero, you cannot rank the player. So it seems that uh, larger the beta, the more difference uh, uh, the, the, the skills between different players. So it will be easier to rank the player. So your whole beta will be large. On the other hand, uh, according to the official information and intuition, one over beta is the effective sample size of the problem, right? So you want the beta to be small, so you have uh, more uh, players whose ability is close to you, right? So uh, in the end, the exact effect of beta in the minimax rate is not clear, right? So And we will see the exact uh, effect uh, in the formula of the minimax rate. So this is the main result. So let me assume, again, theta is regular, and here, uh, we have a different assumption for the connectivity of the random graph. We assume uh, P over beta is at least of order log N. Uh, so this is a different uh, assumption uh, that you have in the Gaussian model. I will come back to this assumption later and tell you the meaning of this assumption. But first, uh, let's just move on and uh, see the result. So this is the result of the minimax rate of full ranking uh, under the uh, BTL model with respect to the condensed task loss. Uh, as you can see, uh, we still have the phase transition phenomenon between uh, the exponential rate and a polynomial rate. So the exponential rate is an average of some exponential function, and on the exponents, the, the denominator beta is given by vi. The definition is given as below. So this is the local uh, variance function uh, uh, that, is, that is defined to be one over the average of the derivative of the difference of uh, skills. Right, so, and the signal to noise ratio parameter of the minimax rate, as you can see, is given by uh, LP beta squared over the maximum of uh, beta and one over n. So it's uh, more complicated than the Gaussian uh, rate. 
So let's just make some simplification to uh, understand the meaning of the minimax rate. So what is uh, complicated is actually uh, the exponent. So let's try to simplify the exponent and find uh, the order of the exponent, right? So this is the order of the exponent. Uh, you can easily show that uh, the order is exactly uh, the same order uh, of the signal to noise ratio. And let's just uh, 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 further make the assumption that uh, beta is at least of order one over n. Then the minimax rate uh, can be simplified into the following formula. And you can see uh, uh, the signal to noise ratio is of order uh, LP times beta. Right, so and when the signal to noise ratio is above one, it is an exponential function of the signal to noise ratio, otherwise, it's a polynomial function. Okay, so let's compare uh, the minimax rate that we have. So uh, we have the minimax rate of ranking under the BTL model and the minimax rate under the Gaussian model. So let's specifically look at the row of beta, right? So the, for the Gaussian model, uh, the signal to noise ratio parameter np beta squared over sigma squared depends on beta uh, quadratically, right? It's beta squared in the signal to noise ratio, but for BTL, it's just a, B, it's just a beta in the signal to noise ratio. The dependence is linear. So why do we have such a difference? Well, actually, we can uh, rewrite uh, the signal to noise ratio lp beta as the product of uh, l times one over beta times p times beta squared, right? So here uh, uh, we can make exact correspondence between uh, uh, the role played by each term uh, uh, with the corresponding role in the Gaussian comparison model. For example, this one of a beta, as we just uh, uh, illustrated in the fish information calculation, it can be understood as the effect, effective sample size, right? So the effective sample size uh, of the Gaussian model is n, so one over beta placed as the same row as n uh, in a Gaussian model. And then we have the signal strength parameter beta squared. Uh, it is just uh, the same beta square uh, in a Gaussian model, right? So if you decompose LP beta in this way, then it is very clear that the effective sample size is one over beta and the signal strength is beta squared. And this explains why uh, you have a linear dependence instead of a quadratic dependence uh, 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 as you uh, as you can see in the Gaussian model, right? So it's it's actually helpful to uh, to study the Gaussian model first, so that you can understand uh, the meaning of the parameter in the in, in the BTL model. Okay. So and uh, 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 and in the end, uh, we are trying to understand the meaning of this assumption p over beta greater than log n. And let me remind you that the corresponding assumption for the Gaussian model is n p beta. Sorry. Uh, the, the corresponding assumption of the Gaussian model is mp greater than log n, right? So mp greater than log n, just to make sure that the entire graph is connected, right? So uh, this assumption is basically uh, replacing the n in the Gaussian uh, condition by one over beta, right? So if you replace n by one over beta, so mp becomes p over beta, so you, you get this assumption, right? So by the corresponding, by the correspondence between one over beta and n, which both have the meaning of effective sample size, uh, uh, th this assumption uh, looks natural. But the exact meaning of this assumption can again be seen from the uh, Fisher information approximation formula, right? So th this approximation formula tells you that the information of ranking really concentrates on uh, each uh, neighborhood graph of uh, each player i, right? So for player i, you only need to consider players whose ranks are close to the rank of i with radius one over beta. That's why what you really need to work on is the, uh, is the local neighborhood graph, right? The graph is, uh, is of size uh, one over beta. And the condition that the p over beta greater than log n is really to make sure that all neighborhood graphs are connected, right? So for the Gaussian model, you only need to work with the entire global graph, but here, uh, we have n different local neighborhood graph to work with. And this assumption uh, uh, makes sure uh, the connectivity uh, happens uh, uh, for each graph. Okay, so uh, this is the first part of the talk. We have talked about the minimax rate of the problem. So in the second part, uh, I, I would like to discuss the optimal procedure, uh, the algorithm that we derive 
to achieve the minimum max weight. So this uh, is from the idea of divide and conquer. Um, uh, and the idea of the algorithm is motivated by, uh, uh, again, the fish information formula uh, uh, that uh, uh, information really concentrates on local graph, right? We only need to consider players uh, whose skills are close. So uh, here is the main idea. So at the first step, we are trying to partition players into several leagues. And uh, uh, in each league, uh, we hope player skills are similar. And in the second step, uh, we want to compute local maximum likelihood estimators. And then we want to aggregate results uh, to have the overall ranks. So let's uh, proceed. So let's first talk about uh, step one. So in step one, uh, we are trying to propose a league partition algorithm. So what is league partition? So here is a very nice example of league partition, right? So this is uh, 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 the English uh, football system. So here, what I list is the table of the uh, top five leagues. You, you have the top league, Premier League, and then uh, the fifth league, uh, this is called National League, and you have Championship League One and League Two, okay? Uh, I think this is a very nice example of league partition, and the table is taken from uh, 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 the result of the last season. So you can see uh, Liverpool was the champion of uh, Premier League and Leeds United was the champion of championship and was promoted to Premier League uh, this season. Uh, let's make, let's try to make some observations, right? So what is considered, what properties are considered as good properties of a good partition? So for example, you can see that the league partition here really groups uh, teams with close skills, right? Uh, Premier League uh, groups uh, uh, the, the best players together, right? And Championship is the second level, and then uh, uh, League One is the third level, so on and so forth, right? So of course you, you you have some uncertainty between two neighboring leagues. For example, uh, uh, the Premier League teams former Watford and Norwich. Uh, these teams are on the bottom of the Premier League, and they are not necessarily stronger than Leeds United and West Brom or Fulham, right? So that's why you have the relegation and promotion system uh, that happens uh, at the end of each season to make the local adjustion, right? So, uh, uh, but apart from that, uh, 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 we definitely have a domination between uh, leagues uh, if they are not neighbors, right? If you compare Premier League and League One, uh, it is very safe to say every team in Premier League is stronger than every team uh, in League One, right? And you can also say every team in Championship is uh, stronger than every team in League Two. This is uh, this should be true, right? Otherwise, it's not a good uh, league partition. And basically, this uh, these are the properties that uh, that we want in designing the league partition algorithm. Let's let, let's try to summarize the good properties. So we want the partition to satisfy. Uh, first of all, uh, players in the same or neighboring leagues should have close skills. Okay, and the second property is the opposite argument. Uh, we want players having close skills. Uh, uh, they should be either in the same league or in uh, neighboring leagues. And lastly, uh, if players belong to two leagues that are not neighbors, it should be very clear which, which player is uh, the stronger player, right? So if, uh, uh, if another player is from two leagues below, then this player should have a clear advantage, okay? So uh, we need uh, the algorithm to satisfy uh, these three uh, nice properties. So here is the algorithm. Remember, we have uh, uh, altogether capital L games. So here I want to do a sample splitting trick to split the L games into two batches. This is just a, a proof technique to make sure we have uh, independence between the two steps. And we are just trying to use uh, the first batch of the game uh, for the league partition algorithm. And the second batch will be reserved for uh, the computation of the local maximum likelihood. Okay, so this is our algorithm. Uh, so our goal is trying to find a partition of the M players. So in the first step of algorithm, uh, what we need to compute is the number of players that clearly dominates each player I, right? So let me go through the algorithm for you. So it says that uh, uh, for each player uh, I, uh, we compute this uh, statistic WI so WI has a superscript one. So this means WI at the first step. So it is defined to be the sum of AIJ times some indicator function, right? So if you look at the event of the indicator, the event is YIJ bar 
smaller than psi of negative 2m. So here, uh, the, the constant m is chosen to be a very large constant. So psi to the uh, psi of negative 2m, remember psi is, an, uh, uh, is the sigmoid function. So this number is a very small number. For example, uh, 0 0.01, right? A very small number. So y bar ij is smaller than a very small number. Uh, this means uh, a player i uh, has lost almost all games against player j. Right? And wi simply counts how many players that can dominate uh, player i. Right? So the next step is trying, uh, we are trying to form the top league. S1 is the top league. So if a player belongs to top league, that player should not have uh, too many strong opponents. Okay, so as long as uh, the number of players that dominate player i is smaller than uh, h, we set some threshold h, then this player will be uh, classified as a member of the top league. Okay, so this is how we form the top league S1. And basically, we are just trying, we are, what, what we do next is just uh, uh, repeat the same process uh, in the remaining set of the player. And then we have S2, right? So then we remove players in S1 and S2, and then repeat the same process. And then we have S3. We do it again and again until we run out of the player. Then all the players are partitioned into uh, at most capital K leagues, OK? So uh, let's try to understand the behavior of the algorithm and see whether it has nice property, right? So uh, uh, the analysis of the league partition algorithm uh, really depends on the understanding of uh, these critical statistics. And remember, w, for example, this is WI at the first step. It, it is defined to be the number of players that can dominate uh, I, all right? So it is the sum of AIJ and some indicator function. So it is uh, clearly a binomial uh, random variable. So you can just uh, use a standard uh, uh, concentration uh, results like Bernstein and Quality to understand the magnitude of each WI. And you can exactly characterize the property of the top league, right? However, uh, what is really difficult is the analysis of the uh, WIs in the next step, right? So for example, at the K plus one step, you have WI uh, uh, to, uh, uh, with superscript K plus one. Uh, uh, it counts the number of players that can dominate player I in the remaining set of the players, right? So you have removed the previous leagues S1 to SK. Now you have seen a potential dependence between AIJ and the previous leagues S1 and SK. And how do you tackle this dependence, right? You cannot really argue that this is a, a binomial random variable. And in fact, uh, if you still remember the algorithm, right? So each step uh, depends on the previous one. So uh, you really need to work with lots of the dependence uh, to understand the behavior uh, of the algorithm. Uh, what I would like to show is, uh, I want to show that uh, it is actually true that AIJ is approximately independent from the previous leagues S1 through SK, right? And why is that? Well, why is this true? Well, let me try to illustrate this argument uh, using uh, using this picture. Okay, so uh, uh, actually, I, I need an arrow. So let me uh, let me ex uh, exit the full screen mode so you can see uh, 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 my arrow. Hopefully, okay. So uh, first of all, uh, we have this uh, orange box. Right, so we have the orange box. Let me make this larger. So we have this orange box. Uh, this is actually uh, the area that has already been partitioned into uh, the first K leagues. Uh, for example, uh, at the K step, uh, our algorithm selects player into the K league uh, as long as uh, these W I K. Uh, 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 the uh, as long as these wi case are below uh, some threshold right so this means there is a dashed line as you can see here uh, and all the wi's should be on the left hand side of this dashed line right so in other words uh, uh, there is a gray area okay so here is a gray area uh, such that wi in the first case steps uh, should only depend on aij uh, that are in the gray area Right? As a result, the first K leagues uh, only depend on uh, AIJs in the gray area. So now uh, we are trying to form the next league. This is the K plus one league. Right? According to the definition, 
we need to select the players from the blue box, right? So we, we remove all the players in the first K leagues. The data we have is in the blue box, okay? Uh, since we should only use games played between the remaining players, uh, the WIs at the K plus one step uh, only use AIJs that are in the yellow area, right? So that's according to the definition. And you can see there is a separation Right, so I have a white strip. This is a separation between the gray area and the uh, uh, yellow area. So it is uh, clear from the picture, at least, that the uh, AIJ and the previous partition S1 through SK use AIJs uh, uh, in uh, this joint area. One use the gray area, the other use the yellow area. Therefore, you can argue there is at least an approximate independence between the two uh, uh, random quantities. And we, uh, by this argument, we can show uh, that it is true uh, that conditioning on the previous uh, leaks, uh, WI at the K plus one step is actually approximately binomial. And then you can use concentration inequality to, to study uh, WI at the K plus one step, right? By iteratively exploiting this approximate independence argument of each step, we can establish the following theorem on the statistical properties of the leak partition. So uh, I set H in this way, and then we have the following three properties with high probability. So the first one is if I and J belong to either the same league or neighboring leagues, then the ranks between the ranks of the two players are close with all the one over beta. The second property is the, the opposite argue, uh, uh, statement. If uh, they are, the ranks are close, then the two players should belong to either the same league or neighboring leagues. And lastly, uh, 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 there is no error between that. There is no error that you can make between players in uh, leagues that are not neighbors, right? Uh, if I belongs to the case league, J belongs to the L league, as long as L is greater than or equal to K plus two, it will be definitely true that uh, uh, I is a stronger player than uh, uh, J. So here. Uh, uh, I set the high, uh, I set the parameter h. This is the threshold in the algorithm to be uh, the constant m times uh, p over beta. Uh, this is uh, not practical in uh, in reality because you do not know uh, p and beta. But uh, uh, we can certainly uh, replace uh, h by a an estimator of h, right? So h can be easily estimated from the data, and this uh, and the result of the theorem can still be proved uh, with uh, such an estimator. Okay, so this is uh, uh, step one. Uh, now, before I talking about step two, which is the local uh, maximum likelihood estimator, uh, I want to first uh, give a remark on uh, some interesting property of the loss function of Kandel style. It is actually this property that motivates the design of step two. So let's uh, first review the definition of Kandel style. Uh, the definition is given by one of n times the sum of the uh, ranks that are in uh, that are inverse, right? So uh, you look at all the pairs and, and see how many pairs are, uh, are inverse. So you can actually rewrite the Kandel's task loss in this way uh, uh, as a normalized Hamming distance, okay? And this is the Hamming distance of the relation matrix. So here, capital Rij is the indicator of uh, small Ri smaller than uh, Rj, right? So uh, the, the, uh, this gives you the definition of the relation matrix. And the Kandel's tau can be written as the Hamming distance between error of the relation matrix. So what you are what you are really doing is the estimation of the relation matrix. It is sufficient to estimate the relation matrix if you want to uh, rank uh, the players, right? But this is not the end of the story because if you have a rank vector r hat, you can you can turn it into a relation matrix by considering uh, the indicator r hat smaller than r j hat, then you have capital r hat as the relation, as the estimator of the relation matrix, right? However, the question is, uh, can we uh, also have the reverse process, right? So if I give you an arbitrary reverse matrix, uh, if I give you an arbitrary uh, relation matrix, can you turn it into a vector, right? This is the question, this is what we want. And this lemma uh, says it is true, right? So according to the lemma, if we have any binary matrix as our relation matrix, right, we can define, we can construct a rank vector by simply 
uh, uh, computing the sum of the relation matrix at each row, right? So for player I, uh, you just compute the sum of uh, uh, the matrix uh, R hat, and this will, ser will be served as a score of player I, and then you, you just obtain uh, the overall rank of the uh, of the n players by sorting uh, the n row sums and in this way you obtain a rank vector uh, which is a rank estimator whose error given by Kandel's tau is bounded by uh, uh, the heavy distance of uh, the relation matrix estimation error up to a factor of four right so according to this inequality as long as you can estimate the relation matrix, you can uh, turn the estimator into a rank estimator. Uh, this is uh, uh, the idea of step two, right? So uh, the goal is very clear. We are trying to fill uh, this uh, n by n relation matrix. And let's try to see uh, how the algorithm uh, proceeds. Okay, so this is our first two. And first two uh, is the divide part of the divide and conquer algorithm. This is the league partition algorithm that we just uh, described. And let's suppose uh, we have divided the M players into altogether eight leagues. Uh, so the relation matrix is divided into eight by eight altogether 64 blocks. And now our goal is trying to uh, fill all the 64 blocks, right? So there are already some blocks that we can fill uh, just according to the nice property of the league partition, right? For example, we can certainly fill uh, this block that is highlighted. Uh, this is the block uh, that describes relation between players in uh, the top league and players in the uh, in the third league, right? But the player in uh, but the top league and the third league they are not neighbors, right? So uh, it must be true that every player in the first league is stronger than every player in the third league. You can definitely fill in this uh, block according to the property that we prove uh, for the league partition algorithm, and for the same reason. You can actually uh, fill in all the blocks in the first row, uh, uh, except you cannot fill the block. Uh, uh, you cannot fill the first block and the second block in the first row, right? And for the same reason, you can fill in all the blocks as long as the block does not describe relation between uh, the same league or between neighboring leagues, right? For the other block, you just fill uh, uh, fill in the matrix entries according to the property of league partition. Okay, so this is the this is what what we can do for step one. Now in step two, what we need to do is just to fill in the remaining block, right? To define the relation between players whose skills are close to each other. Uh, this is where you can use the maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, let's consider this a uh, uh, sub problem. Let's let's say we are trying to fill in these four blocks that describe relation between players in the K league and K plus one league. Okay. So it's very simple. Uh, uh, remember, we have sample splitting. We are going to use the second batch for the computation of the local maximum likelihood estimator. And uh, just write down uh, the negative log likelihood function uh, 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 using all the players that are related to the, uh, the, uh, the block that we need to analyze. Uh, this is our objective function of MLE. And the minimizer is the maximum likelihood estimator. And then uh, the relation estimator rij hat is the indicator of r uh, theta i hat greater than theta j hat, right? It's a very straightforward idea. Now, uh, 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 I want to emphasize that the, the only thing that is not obvious here is the choice of the range of the summation, right? So even though uh, we only work with the case block and the k plus ones block, uh, it turns out uh, the definition of the MLE also depends on the previous league SK minus one and the next league SK plus two. Uh, this subtlety is actually necessary uh, to achieve uh, statistical efficiency. And I want to explain uh, what's happening here uh, by an example uh, of the English Premier League. So suppose we want to compare uh, Fulham and the Sunderland, okay? Uh, the team in Fulham is in championship last season uh, and uh, uh, Sunderland uh, uh, in League One. So what we need to do is at least to include all teams uh, in Championship and League One in the computation of the local maximum likelihood estimator, right? However, according to the Fisher information formula, uh, we should include all teams 
uh, in the neighborhood of the team that we need to do inference, right? So for Fulham, not only we uh, need to include teams in the championship, we should also include uh, Premier League teams uh, such as Aston Villa, uh, Bournemouth, Watford, and Norwich, uh, because these teams that uh, in the bottom of the uh, Premier League table, uh, they should be considered as a, a, a neighborhood of Fulham, right? So they are they are very similar to Fulham in terms of the skills. Uh, 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 therefore, uh, uh, that's why uh, we act when we compute MLE, uh, we should also include the Premier League uh, teams uh, just to include these bottom league table, uh, right? So uh, uh, bottom table league uh, teams, right? Sorry. And for the same reason, uh, we also need to include teams in League Two, right? And uh, 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 this explains why uh, uh, when we compute the local maximum likelihood estimator, we actually need to use four leagues, right? Not only do we need the, uh, the two leagues that we work with, we also need the uh, previous league and the next league. And by doing that, according to the uh, visual information approximation formula, we will have a very good approximation of visual information, and this will achieve uh, statistical efficiency, which leads to the right constant in the uh, uh, in the exponent uh, of the minimax rate, right? So I also want to remark that the divide and conquer algorithm uh, is also computationally efficient uh, because it uh, divides the computation of MLE into uh, several small problems. And for each uh, sub problem, uh, you can actually show that the, uh, 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 the Hessian of the uh, log likelihood uh, 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 function uh, is well conditioned because the local dynamic range uh, of uh, of neighboring uh, players are bounded, right? So this implies uh, the optimization problem is well conditioned. So if you apply grid descent, it has a, a guaranteed convergence. And in fact, uh, it, you can show it has a guaranteed uh, very fast convergence. So the algorithm is designed to have uh, both uh, statistical efficient and computational efficient uh, properties. Okay, so now let's move on uh, to finish the algorithm. We are trying to fill in the remaining blocks. So this is step two. Uh, let's say we are trying to fill in the, uh, the, 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 uh, the blocks that are related to S2 and, sorry, S1 and S2, right? So uh, this uh, requires us to compute the local MLE using leaks, uh, in, using leaks of uh, S0, S1, S2, S3, uh, but there is no S0. So you just use S1, S2, and S3, right? So this uh, helps you to fill these blocks. And next, we are using a local MLE for uh, uh, two, three, four, five, and you fill more blocks, right? You do it again and again, and in the end, you just uh, fill all the blocks uh, that are remain, right? So uh, that are left. And as you can see, now we have successfully uh, 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 find an estimator for each Rij. Uh, in the entire matrix. So then uh, uh, we just use the previous lemma to turn this matrix into a rank estimator by computing the row sum and then right rank and row sum, we will obtain a full rank estimation procedure. Okay, this is the uh, entire description of the algorithm. All right, so uh, in the end, let me just uh, briefly analyze the algorithm. So the most difficult part is the analysis of the uh, MLE. So let's try to look at the error for uh, RIJ that describes relation uh, between teams that are either in the same league or uh, in, the, uh, in the neighboring leagues. And the error, according to uh, our definition of the estimator, is given by the probability of theta i hat smaller than theta j hat uh, uh, or the probability of theta i hat greater than theta j hat, depending on uh, whether the true uh, theta i uh, r i is greater than theta r j or not, right? So uh, it is the probability that the relation is uh, reversed. And uh, this probability can be shown to be bounded by this exponential function. And here the denominator is our variance function that we just uh, defined. And uh, the way that we obtain this sharp tail probability bound of the local maximum likelihood estimator is, is given by uh, a lever out and green descent analysis. Uh, so I have uh, uh, reviewed this uh, technique uh, in my Tuesday's talk uh, when I discussed the, the problem of top key ranking, right? So uh, uh, I show uh, for top key ranking, the maximum likelihood estimator is optimal and the analysis of the MLE it depends on this uh, delicate devil out and green descent analysis. 
And here we can basically borrow the same idea to analyze the property of local MLE and just the following the same recipe, uh, you can get the uh, uh, exponential bound for the probability of the difference uh, with the right exponent. Now uh, you can see uh, 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 according to our basic inequality, the risk of Kandel's tau is bounded by the sum of these uh, uh, error uh, uh, of a relation. So the, in, the total error is bounded by uh, the sum of the uh, of the uh, of the exponential functions, right? So I haven't talked about the pairs uh, with uh, between players in uh, leagues that are not neighbors, but remember, uh, for these pairs, there is no mistake. So we only need to consider pairs uh, in neighboring leagues or the same league, right? So we get the, this uh, bound as the sum of exponential functions. Now uh, we only need to arrange rearrange this sum, right? So we have two regimes. The first regime is when the signal to noise ratio is below one. Uh, in this regime, we are supposed to get the polynomial rate, and this is how you can prove that. Uh, it's a very straightforward uh, uh, rearrangement. Uh, you basically use the fact that, uh, uh, you know, in this first step, you use the fact that the uh, variance function is of order uh, the, uh, the maximum between uh, m beta and 1. And you also use the property that the difference between theta i and theta j is of order beta times the difference of the rank i and the j. Okay. And, uh, and next step, you replace the sum by integral. Right. In the end, using a Gaussian density integration uh, 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 formula, you get uh, uh, you get the polynomial rate. Right. So uh, the uh, the rearrangement of the sum in the exponential rate when the signal to noise ratio is above one is also straightforward. It's actually simpler. Right. So here, what we have is the sum of exponentially decreasing functions. So the first step, uh, really trying to analyze the geometric uh, progression. Right. So if you, if you analyze a geometric series, uh, it's always the leading term that dominates the entire sum. So you use that to derive to, to in the first inequality. And uh, the second inequality is just by realizing uh, that the uh, variance function between neighboring players are asymptotic equivalent. So you can uh, replace two times vi plus two times vi plus one by four times vi. This gives you the exact formula uh, of minimax rate in the exponential regime. Okay, so it's all very straightforward calculation once you have the tail probability uh, uh, of the error. Right, I think that's the end of the talk. Uh, let me try to summarize the result that we have uh, 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 for the two talks. So in my first talk, I talk about uh, top gear ranking and this talk is about full ranking. Uh, I think it's uh, a, a good idea to uh, conclude with some uh, comparison. So uh, let's first look at the difference of the two loss functions. So for the top key ranking problem, uh, we consider a normalized Hamming distance because the top key ranking problem is essentially a variable selection problem, right? So the loss function is defined to be the sum of type one and type two error. And for the full ranking, we consider Kandel's tau. And uh, the minimax rate is also different. Uh, the minimax rate of top key ranking is a typical form of the rate that you get in the variable selection problem. It's exponential rate, uh, but for full ranking, uh, what you get, uh, uh, you, uh, you will have this uh, uh, transition between exponential rate and polynomial rate because of the property of the uh, uh, rank vector. Right now, the analysis of the two problems depends on two different basic inequality. So for the uh, for the top key ranking problem. Uh, we bound the loss, we bound the risk function by the error of the oracle thresholding rule, but for full ranking, we bound the risk uh, by the uh, error of the estimation of the pairwise uh, uh, relation matrix, right? So, and since uh, in the full ranking, we estimate the, uh, the relation matrix using the local MLE, you can actually relate the uh, probability of error of relation uh, by the probability uh, that the uh, theta i hat is greater than theta j hat. So in the end, for both top key ranking and full ranking, uh, you trying to uh, uh, estimate, you trying to analyze uh, the probability of some uh, entries of the maximum likelihood estimate, right? So for the top key ranking, you just need to analyze one entry, but uh, for full ranking, you, ask, uh, you analyze the two entries and both can be uh, accurately analyzed, analyzed by a lever out and grid descent analysis, right? So that's, I think, unifies the technique that we have uh, for the two problems. Uh, and uh, this is uh, 
uh, I think the end of the talk. Uh, I would like I would really like to thank you for the attention and thank again thank the organizer uh, for the very uh, uh, for the very kind invitation and the very nice conference. And thank you all. Uh, I think I'm ready to take some questions. <laughs>